This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Forecasting techniques. Now, there are three separate techniques we need to go through. Two of them are quite related, but um, three techniques. Um, and we'll have three lectures, therefore. The three techniques that can be useful when we're forecasting. And the first one is something called the high-low method. Uh, for, for reasons which hopefully will become obvious as we go through. But what it relates to, when we're preparing budgets and whatever, um, we've basically got two types of costs. We've got variable costs, such as uh, what, the cost of materials. You know, maybe five dollars a unit, so the more units we produce, the more the cost will be. Uh, we've got fixed costs, maybe the rent of the factory, where the cost for the year will be fixed in the sense that it's independent of the number of units produced. However, an awful lot of the costs are what we call semi-variable. Uh, they're part fixed and part variable. Uh, an example of that is um, Perhaps electricity. I don't know how you're charged or your company's charged for electricity, but there might be a standing charge where you've got to pay a hundred dollars a month, whatever. But then uh, an extra cost, depending on the electricity used, which obviously is higher or lower, depending on the level of activity. Or similarly, telephones. Um, very commonly, there's a fixed charge each month. Okay, Ten dollars a month for your phone or something. But then in addition, you have the variable cost, depending on the number of calls that are made. Now, in a perfect world, if we drew a little graph, and a very rough graph here, you're not going to be drawing graphs uh, over this in the exam. Uh, but suppose, well, I'll use telephone as an example, telephone expense. If I did a little graph of uh, the cost in dollars, against the uh, number of calls. Again, maybe there's a fixed charge. Uh, maybe I have to pay $10 a month, regardless of how many calls I make. But in addition, there'll be a charge per call on top of that. So if I make no calls at all, we'll just pay uh, $10, the fixed charge. But if I make 10 calls, 20 calls, 30 calls, well, if the cost per call is a dollar, then if you make 10 calls, you'll pay an extra $10, you pay 20. If you make 20 call calls, you pay an extra $20. So in total, 30, if you make 30 calls, an extra. Ooh. 30, so you pay 40 in total. I think you see what I'm trying to get at. Um, so you've got that fixed ten dollars or whatever happens, plus a variable cost. That bit's fixed, this bit's variable. Uh, a variable cost depending on the number of calls made. Alright, well that's fine, and certainly to telephone, in fact, you would expect it to be precisely like that. If it's a fixed ten dollars a month and then a dollar a call on top. But there are plenty of other costs where it wouldn't be quite as precise. Suppose instead I was looking at uh, uh, electricity based on the uh, units produced. Well in real life things don't work perfectly. You know, so although you would expect perhaps there to be a fixed charge, if only for the lights in the factory. But in addition, there'll be a variable cost. Sorry, start again. The lights in the factory, because they run all the time, whether you produce one unit or a thousand. But in addition, uh, an extra cost for electricity, depending on how much we use the machines, and that bit's going to be variable. But I think it'd be unlikely if it worked perfectly as per the graph. You know, you might find if you did a graph month by month of how much we'd spent on electricity, 
uh, as against how many units we produced, you might find it was a little bit like that. That it wasn't me exactly linear. You know, sometimes you spend a bit more than you'd expect, sometimes a bit less. You'd expect them to be more or less in a straight line, but not precisely. And so this is where high-low comes in. Suppose, turn to page, uh, the third page, where you see an, an exercise. We've got there a table which shows the total costs recorded at different activity levels during the year. So maybe um, uh, we've looked at, however many there are, I think it's seven months there. Maybe we've looked at the past seven months. And some month, one month we produced 100 units, the next month 400, the next month 200, the next month 700, and so on. So month by month we're producing more, we're producing less. And we've also got for each month the total cost. Uh, maybe it's the electricity bill. Uh, the total cost. Month one we produced 100 units and spent 40,000. Month two, 400 units we spent 65,000, and so on. Well, just looking at that, it does look to be something like that graph I've drawn. I'm not going to put them all on a graph, we'd be here forever, but if you look at it, 100 units we spent 40,000. The next month, produce a lot more, and fine, the cost is a lot more. Next month, produce less, the cost is less, and so on. So it does look to be following this sort of pattern. But, Two things. Uh, one is, it's not completely variable. If it was completely variable, then um, uh, since month two, we spent four times as much as month one, the cost would be four times as much, and it isn't. So it's not completely variable. It's going to be part fixed, part variable, a bit like that graph I was looking at. But also, uh, although I'm not going to put them all on a graph, uh, I think you know what I mean. I could. Don't, I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to finish this. But we could have the cost as against units. I would say month one it was 100 units and the cost was 40,000. Month two, 400 units and the cost was 65,000. Uh, month three, 200 units and the cost was 45,000. We could put them all on a graph. However, and I'll go yourself if you want, although it does appear to be more or less, as I was talking before, this semi-variable business, um, they're not actually going to be completely linear. Um, look at the fifth and sixth months. In the fifth and sixth months, the fifth month we produced 600 and paid 70,000. The next month we only 500. But the cost didn't go down, it was still 70,000. So in fact, what would happen if you did put them all on a graph, you would get a, a graph something like this, where they do look to be more or less in a straight line, but not exactly. And so what we want to do, we know it's not ever, not ever going to be perfect, but we want to find out approximately what is the variable cost per unit and what is the fixed cost per month. Now we could put them all on a graph and try and draw a line, but we're not going to do that. There are two approaches, the first of which is high-low and it's a very simple one. Uh, the formula is actually on the previous page. But rather than blindly use a formula, what we do is this. We say, first of all, what's the highest? What we call dependent variable. What I mean by that is if this is output and cost, surely you expect the cost to depend on the level of output. More output, more cost, less output, less cost. And so the cost depends on the output. 
And we say, from those seven months we've looked at, which one gave the highest cost? And the highest cost, ooh, check me here, is 85,000? And how many units was that for? It was for 700. We then look again and say, which one was the lowest? And so again, the lowest cost uh, from those seven months, the lowest one is 40,000. And what was the output? That was for 100 units. So we just hit the highest and the lowest. And we then say, well, why is the cost different? Um, the cost of the highest is higher by 45,000. Why is it higher? Uh, any fixed cost will have been the same in both months. It's higher because of the extra variable cost of producing an extra 600 units. So again, fixed costs will have been the same. The only reason why uh, one is $45,000 more than the other, that must be the variable cost of the extra 600 units. And therefore, the variable cost per unit Uh, 45,000 was the variable cost of 600 units. And so per unit, um, oh dear, yes, 75. So we now know the variable cost is $75. And having got the variable cost, now we can easily work out what the fixed cost per month is. If we look back at the highest one, we know what the total cost was, 85,000. That total cost is the total of uh, the fixed cost plus the total variable cost. Well, the variable cost, I'm looking at the highest, we've done 700 units. Well, at 75 each, the total variable cost that month would have been 52,500. And therefore the rest of that total of 85 must be the fixed cost per month. And what does it come to? 32,500. And we can actually check that, or don't waste time in the exam, for heaven's sake, be confident. But I can check it because if you look at the lowest month, uh, the total variable cost, well, in the lowest month we produced 100 units. So 100 at 75, 7,500. In addition, a fixed cost every month, which uh, I'd worked out at 32,500. And so the total cost should be 40,000. And was it? Yes, it was. Uh, but, um, so I mean, you can get the fixed cost by looking at either of them. But again, don't waste time in the exam and um, checking in that way. But there we are. Uh, and we, we could now use that for forecasting because we can say that however many units we produce, so for X units, you know, if I'm trying to forecast for next month, next month I think we'll produce 800 units or something. Well, can we not say that the total cost, there's always going to be the fixed cost of 32,500. But in addition, a variable cost of 75 for every unit, and therefore with X units, a total of 75X. So that's where it fits in with forecasting. We've looked at past months to determine what the fixed and the variable costs are. As I said a moment ago, if I wanted to forecast for next month, if I know how many units we're forecasting or producing, 
and then I can stick it in that equation uh, and forecast what the cost will be. All right, now that's high low, and although it's a nice easy exercise, there are in fact two big problems. One is we've only looked at extremes. You know, I said we could have put all these on a graph. Do, 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 Start again. We could have plotted them all on a graph. Uh, we know it's not exactly linear, and, but we say, oh, that looks more or less linear, we'll approximate. But all we've done is taken the first one and the last one and treated it as though it's linear between them. Well, that's fine. But just suppose that one, uh, uh, the highest one had been unusually high. It had been up there. Well, we'd only have looked at the highest and lowest, so we would have effectively assumed the costs were going like that. When in fact, that was really abnormal. They were going more like that. So that's one problem. Um, it's very affected by extremes. Uh, the other problem is even the even if um, they had uh, the the points had lain almost on a straight line. Just because they're on a straight line over those values doesn't mean if I was predicting outside, forecasting outside the range, that it would carry on being linear. You see, I said we could um, use, um, I wrote that equation, I said if the production next month was expected to be 800, 900, we could estimate a cost. But it could be, if production got higher and higher, that in fact it started to become a curve. Well, using that equation would be assuming it carried on in a straight line, but it might not. And so um, it's dangerous to forecast outside the range. You know, if our values are more or less linear, then okay, we can be reasonably confident if we're forecasting, you know, within the existing range. But you, if you are trying to forecast outside it, there is that risk. Anyway, that's the uh, high-low approach. Uh, as I've said, uh, on the one hand, it is very easy, it's very quick, but this problem of being affected by extremes, the highest or the lowest um, being unusually high or low, which is why a better approach is the one I'll do within the next lecture, which is called regression analysis. But anyway, that's high low, we'll leave that bit there.